Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak to you this morning. I hope you've been refreshed this week with the doctrine and edified and built up. You know, the Bible tells us that we are supposed to bring folks into remembrance of these doctrines. So this morning my topic is liberation and liberty. And uh, many of the things I'm going to speak and a lot of the verses that I'm going to use you've already heard this week because when you look at sanctification and redemption and you look at all these different things, they start to come together, don't they? So hopefully we'll be able to reinforce some things for you. But let's start with a word of prayer and we'll jump right in. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have to spend together in your word. I pray that we'll be edified and grow in your word. We thank you for your word, but especially for your son. In his name, amen. So my topic today is liberation. And uh, let me run you through my thinking here real quick. Uh, One of the beautiful things you get to do when you preach is... If you walked around all day preaching to yourself out loud, you would uh, quickly be locked up, right? So when people give you the opportunity to preach, you get to preach things at yourself uh, a little more enthusiastically than you would if you were just walking around preaching to yourself. But my topic is liberation today. And uh, in order to study liberation, I think we've got to figure out a couple different things. So in order to study liberation, I think you've got to understand bondage. Would you agree with me on that? Because if I'm going to look at liberty, then I've got to understand bondage and and what I was in bondage to or what I am in bondage to. The next thing to understand liberty is how does liberty happen? So if I'm in bondage, how do I get out of bondage? And then the third point, which I'm going to spend the majority of my time on today is how do I walk, how do I stand fast in that liberty which I have? And the reason that is such an important topic, because what's the point of liberty if you don't use it? So as we go through my message today, and we look at the scriptures, those are the three main points I'm going to try and convey to you today. So let's start off with bondage. Now, as far as I can tell, There's four types of bondage in the scripture. So let's talk about those four types of bondage. The first one is bondage to to sin and to the flesh. This is one that we don't need to talk about a lot, right? Because we're all experts on it. We're still going to talk about it. But uh, it's bondage to the sin, to sin and to flesh. Go to to Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to consider the lost man, and I want you to consider yourself as well before you were saved. Ephesians chapter 2 says this. It says, you, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also... We all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. So in our natural state in Adam, in our flesh, we are in bondage to sin, and we are in bondage to the flesh. And the way our flesh works is there's a course to this world And the course of this world is made up of a couple different things. It says it's by the prince of the power of the air, right? But then when you put a whole bunch of sinners in one place, like the world, and you get them all sinning together, what do you have? You've got a crowd. You've got a little bit of peer pressure, right? You're only cool if you do it. Everybody's doing it. But what happens is this world has a course to it, and it's basically set up like an amusement park for our flesh. And what we have is the desires of the flesh and the desires of the mind. And we walk into this giant amusement park for our flesh. And there's just so much stuff for it to do. And we're trapped in that flesh in bondage because that is exactly how the flesh works. And you know, sometimes 
we go out and we try and do good things in the flesh, even before we're saved. But what we're really doing is we're just serving the flesh and we're serving sin. Think about the lost man's state. When you, when you consider Romans chapter 2, and let's go there. Romans chapter 2, verse 5, says this. This is, this is a sad verse. It says, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So as the lost man goes out and participates in the course of this world in the lust of the flesh and in the lust of his mind, what he does is he gathers some things. Under, you know, you go to the carnival, you play some games and you win some things. What we get in the flesh is wrath unto the day of wrath. What a terrible state to be in. What a horrible place to be. That's true bondage, isn't it? And what can man do to get out of that? By himself, nothing. Because he's a sinner by nature. Romans chapter 7, verse 5. And as he do, does that, he produces fruit. You say, wait a minute. Lost man doesn't produce fruit. Yes, he does, doesn't he? Romans chapter 7, verse 5, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. As Rodney taught, there's, there was the, the reign of sin. What does the reign of sin bring about? It brings about death. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 8. We're going to be in Romans chapter 8 a couple times today. Romans chapter 8, verse 8 tells us this, so then that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So how much can the lost man please God? None. Why? Because he's in the flesh. He operates according to the lust of his flesh, the desires of his mind, in the course of this world, which is set up to keep him busy with it. It's a terrible state to be. So that is a brief summary of bondage in the flesh. And when you are in the flesh, you have one choice you can make. And I don't mean that you don't have free will. Just listen to what I'm saying. You have one choice that you can make to get out of that. And what is that choice? To simply trust in Christ's shed blood on the cross and his death, burial, and resurrection. You can make as many different choices as you want about how you're going to live differently. I want to do this. I want to be righteous. I want to do this. But it doesn't matter because you're still in the flesh. You're still in the playground. And everything you're doing is really just fulfilling the desires of your flesh and of your mind, even if you think it's not. So the only thing that you can do to escape that is to trust in Christ. Now, the second kind of bondage is bondage to the law. And this is kind of default. When you're in bondage to sin, you're in bondage to the law. If you kind of think about this, if, if, if you were in prison and you were bound in these chains of sin, and every time you tried to do something, you stretched on those chains of sin and showed that you were there, and the guard said, ah, ah, that's what the law does. Every time you go to do something. And if you're in the flesh, every time you're doing something, what are you doing? You're doing it by the desires of the flesh and the mind and trying to fulfill those things. And the law holds you there, showing you the entire time. Is the law the problem? No. It just gives you the knowledge of sin, and it shows you. So two types of bondage that we have so far. So we have bondage to the flesh and bondage to the law. Now, are, are we still in Romans chapter 8? Okay, Romans chapter 8 gives us another kind of bondage. And um, Romans chapter 8, I turned too far. In Romans chapter 8, verse 21, it says, Because the creature itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So we are also under a bondage of corruption. And what the bondage of corruption is, is it's simply living in a sin-cursed world. How many of you felt great all week? No problems. <laughs> When you look at this world, is it full of pain and suffering? It is. Does that go away when you get saved? No, in some cases it gets magnified, doesn't it? So we suffer under a bondage of corruption. That's, that's Romans chapter 8. The fourth kind of bondage is, and I'll, 
the, the last kind of bondage is go to Colossians. When you look at Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after, tradi- after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Verse 20 says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? We can come under bondage to the traditions of men and to the rudiments of the world. And how does that differ from the law, you ask me? Well, you've got the law, which is based in the scriptures, correct? And people say, you have to live this way, you have to live this way. But you also have these traditions of men. And quite frankly, they're just things that men make up to put you under, correct? If you've come out of any kind of religion, you We all know that there's certain sects that do this, and there's ones that do this, and there's ones that do this, and you need to toe that line or you get the boot. And many of those are just the rudiments of the world and the traditions of men, and people want to put you in bondage under those. Now, go to Galatians chapter 5. If you think of what I just told you, somewhat like an accordion, we stretched it out and we looked at bondage, and we can see that we've got bondage to sin, bondage to the law, bondage to the corruption of this world, and we can be in bondage to the traditions of men. Now, is there more kind of bondage? Probably. But when you you, you think about this, and you're in Galatians uh, Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, Verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulence, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul gives you a big list of nasty works. And when you look at that work, the big list of nasty works, what does he call them? The works of the flesh. So when you think about the law, you think about sin, you think about the traditions of men, those things that we can be bound into, they all really come down to works of the flesh, right? So I said it works kind of like an accordion. We can stretch it out and look at the middle of it and say, hey, there's, there's this, there's that, there's this, there's this. But when we close it up, it's all bondage. It's all, it's, 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 it's all the same thing. It's all our flesh and us trying to do things through our flesh. And how well do we do things through our fr- flesh according to the scriptures? Not at all. But thank God there's liberty, right? Thank God that through Christ we can be free from these things. So let's talk about liberty a little bit. And let's look at liberty and how we get free from these things. So we get free from the bondage of sin. Go to Romans chapter 6, verse 14. And by the way, every one of these bondages that we either put ourselves in or are in are taken care of by Christ and in Christ when we trust in him. And Romans chapter 6, verse 14 tells us this. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So it tells us sin isn't going to have dominion over us because we're not under the law, but we are under grace. You remember when Rodney taught about reigning, When you think about the flesh and when we're in the flesh and when we're unsaved, sin reigns unto what? Death. When we're in Christ, it's grace unto what? Righteousness, right? Whose righteousness? My righteousness or Christ's righteousness? It's Christ's righteousness. The reason we are free from sin is because of verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, 
that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, even so we shall also be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So when we trust in Christ, we're baptized into his death. And positionally, what dies? Our flesh, right? The old man, as the scriptures refer to it. So when I want liberty from the old man, step number one is what? Get saved. Because through your baptism into Christ, you're going to positionally get rid of that guy. And as Art said, is that different from walking in that truth? It sure is, isn't it? Now, the same thing if you go to Romans chapter 7. And I'm giving you an overview. I want to give you a framework here. And as I said, I'm preaching it myself. So there's things that, as, as we go through here, there are things that, that, that I've learned through the scriptures that, that, that have helped me. And we, when we look at Romans chapter 7, and uh, verse 3, it says, So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be buried to another even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So there, how are we declared dead to the law, scripturally? By the body of Christ, right? Because we're identified with Christ by baptism into his death. Good, you've seen that the answers kind of get easier as you go, because they're kind of all the same. Now we got the next, so we've got, we can be free from the law by trusting in Christ. We can be free from the sin and and, uh, our, our sin and our flesh by trusting in Christ. Now let me ask you this. How do we get free from the bondage of corruption? By trusting in Christ. And when are we freed? According to Romans chapter 8, if you want to go there and look, go ahead and look. If you don't want to, that's fine for sake of time. How are we freed from the bondage of corruption? There's an event that you're predestined to. It's, it's the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. That's when my soul and spirit get sucked out of this flesh and this flesh falls over dead. And do I ever have to worry about it again? No, that's an exciting time, isn't it? I think about all the problems in my life and I know exactly where they come from. Right? <laughs> they come from right here. And uh, I'm good at creating them and I'm good at making messes. And I'm terrible at fixing them. And there's only one way that's ever going to go away. That's when this flesh is gone. Now, when you look at, go to 1 Corinthians chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's talk about the... uh, Traditions of men. When you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and all of Colossians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it says this in verse 1, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means... The serpent beguiled Eve through, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. When you look at Colossians chapter 2 and you compare that with this chapter, what you see is that Paul is worried that people are going to be beguiled from the simplicity that is in Christ. Hopefully, what I've shown you in just the past couple minutes is that there is a simplicity in Christ and simply trusting in his death, burial, and resurrection that takes care of the bondage in our life. And if we allow people to corrupt us from that and we don't walk in it, does it affect some things? It sure does. And and that's what my next point is. It's how do we walk? How do we stand fast in this liberty? Now, let me let me talk to you just for a second. I want I just want to do an illustration over here. I am an unsaved man and I'm in the bondage of this flesh. 
Now, when I get saved, what happens is God's spirit enters into me, correct? And his spirit is dwelling in this old nasty flesh, right? Now, someday over here in the future, this old flesh is going to drop away and I'm going to get a celestial body. So what happens is we look at bondage and we look at we're dead to sin, we're dead to the law, we're free from the traditions of men, we're still operating in the bondage of this corruption, but we've been subjected to hope to look forward and know that that is going to go away. And we look at this and we say, well, I have liberty. And do you have liberty? That's what I just told you. You've got plenty of liberty, right? We know where the liberty came from. But what happens is we look at liberty from the standpoint of this old nasty flesh. Let me illustrate some things. You're on the highway, you're doing 75. What do you tell yourself? Tell yourself you're going too fast. Do you, do you let off the gas or what do you tell yourself? I'm under, I'm under grace. <laughs> you laugh, but <laughs> you laugh, but probably because you're laughing because you've all done that, right? <laughs> no, no, <okay. laughs> Good, let's talk about the bondage of the old man. <laughs> what happens is we look at bondage from the standpoint of our flesh and we look at liberty from the standpoint of our flesh saying, now I'm free from all those things so I can go back into the course of this world, pick up those chains and play with them. What fun. Is that what liberty is? No, is that what your flesh tells you what liberty is? It is, because every time you say, oh, I'm under grace, it's not because you're going to do something good. <laughs> it's because you're going to do something bad. Correct? Is that what grace teaches you? Let me show you a verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says this says, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think that the spirit of the Lord wants to go hang out in the lust of your flesh, in the desires of your mind? Is that what he wants to do? Well, he indwells us in this body. It tells us where the spirit of the Lord is, what is there? is liberty. Do you know why there is liberty where the Spirit of the Lord is? It's because before you were saved, you were over here wrapped in these chains of bondage, of sin, and to the law, and there was nothing you could do about it. But when you got saved, His Spirit comes in and He indwells you. By the way, God's given us His Spirit. Do you know why we have His Spirit? What does 1 Corinthians tell us? That we may know the things that are given to us, right? Freely given to us so that we can understand those things. So we received this spirit and now we've got this old nasty flesh but we've got God's spirit inside of there. Now remember what I told you in the old nasty flesh, the only decisions you could make were how am I going to fulfill the flesh and lust of the flesh? How am I going to fulfill the desires of the mind? What am I going to do today in this amusement park called the course of this world? And you just went out there and played in it. But now... Because you have some knowledge and you have God's spirit in you, you can now open God's word, gain some understanding, learn about the liberty that you've gained in Christ, and make some decisions apart from your old nasty flesh. That's important. That's why where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There's liberty. I can understand th some things. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 says this. But if, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Does his spirit quicken us? Does it allow us to operate outside of that flesh? 
does, doesn't it? Now, hopefully what I've done with you so far is shown you there's four kind of bondages, shown you that you can have liberty from those bondages through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and your identification with him. And that as his spirit indwells you, you can start to be free and work on being free from this old flesh in your walk. Okay? And I want to concentrate on that, those two points for the rest of the time. And I'm, I'm going to talk about walking and standing fast in liberty. I'm going to give you some verses here. And I want you to look at these verses and you're going to say they don't have anything to do with liberty. And what your gut is going to tell you is that they have the opposite to do with liberty. And the first one is 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And it says this. It says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Is that verse written to you? Direct, isn't it? What are we supposed to be doing? Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We'll read number 10 as well. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What should my walk include? Good works. Any argument with that? No, you hear the word good works, and it's like, whoo. I got a duck, I'm at a grace conference, right? <laughs> Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 tells us this in verse 11 For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, that qualify, zealous of good works, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. And Titus chapter 3, verse 8, just the next page over. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. How often? That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto, unto men. See, when we're, we're so used to being in the flesh that when we think about liberty, somebody tells you you've got liberty, your first idea is, is I am free to go play in the prison and with the chains that I used to be bound to. Isn't that a terrible way of thinking? It's a terrible way of thinking. Matter of fact, if you think about sin, you know how the scriptures tell you you, you need to fight sin? You get all kinds of answers. But the, the short answer is, is you don't fight sin. What do you do? You flee, right? You run from it. And when you think about bondage, if you've been stuck here, if I sat you in this chair and I duct taped you up and I stuck you there and I yelled at you all day, <laughs> After a day, don't you think you'd want to get out of that chair? When somebody finally cuts you loose, you say, hey, I'm going to go play with the duct tape. No, you're going to be like, I am getting out of here, and I'm running because what that was doing to me was terrible. So what we do is we look at the liberty we've been given from the flesh, and we think, I'm free to do this, and I'm free to do whatever I want and go play with those chains I was in. But in reality, what you're free to do now is to go out and serve Christ. That's real liberty. And that's a liberty you never had before. You always had the freedom to go play with sin. Nobody had to tell you to do it. But now we have the freedom to go out and serve. Now, I want to give you a couple verses here. And these are what I call uh-oh verses. My wife was looking at my notes this morning. She started laughing because I had uh-oh with an exclamation point written there. And let me give you some uh-oh verses. These are verses. You ever, you ever study your Bible and you get to a verse, you go, oh! And you look at it and you're like, eh, that's in Paul? 
and, and, and it makes you panic for a minute. Matter of fact, one of the verses we just we, we read about won't inherit the kingdom of God in Galatians chapter 5, that's one of those verses people say, I, I'm, I'm in that list. And it says I'm not, well, when you, it's telling you not to act like that because you're no longer those kinds of people, right? But uh, that's one of those uh-oh verses. And here, here's, let me give you, I'm going to give you a list of some uh-oh verses. And I want to look at them in light of liberty. One of them is Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. It says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, he shall also reap. Do we reap what we sow? Absolutely, we do. Is there any argument about that? No, there shouldn't be. It says it. It's right there. It's, it, it's plain to look at. It's easy. Another one is Romans chapter 8. Actually, we're going to look at two in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 is an uh-oh verse for a lot of people. Romans chapter 8, verse 8 says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans chapter 8, verse 13 says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And finally, let's look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verse uh, 25. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. We look at those verses, and those are verses that we look at, and we say those, those, those appear to be about judgment, and I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to explain these in a second. But they're verses that we look at, we say, I thought I was forgiven. How am I going to reap what I sow? How, you look at those verses and you say, wait a minute. If I participate in the flesh, what do you reap? Death, right? How, how does that work in the life of a believer? And what does Romans 6.23 say? For the wages of sin is death. Now, you've got to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say here because if you don't, you're going to think I'm crazy. Is the wages of sin ever not death? No, right? Does sin produce death? It does. Now, sometimes, did it, have, I, have I sinned before? I've done lots of sin. Who took the punishment for my sin? Christ. Do I ever have to worry about that? No, because it was taken care of at his cross. But here, here's the deal. Remember I told you, once you get out of these chains of bondage, you've got this old flesh, and you've got this new Spirit. The Spirit of God is indwelling you. You've got a new man that you can work with, that you're free to serve God with. Your flesh is a boat with a hole in it, okay? <laughs> Let me explain that. Your flesh is a boat with a hole in it. You don't know how big the hole is, and it's been set out to sea. And at some point, it's going to sink, and it's going to end up at the bottom of the ocean. And you, as, the, as a believer, because Christ paid the penalty for your sin, have the option for the rest of your life to wallow in the bondage that he rescued you from and participate in sin. And what that is like is taking things and setting it on a boat with a hole in it. What is eventually going to happen to all the things on the boat with a hole in it? It's going to sink. It's going to end up at the bottom of the sea. So when you walk in the flesh and you participate in sin as a saved person, what you're doing is you're just taking your time and you're loading it onto a boat with a hole in it and it's all going to be bound for the bottom of the sea. I'm not saying that it's going to be in hell, but when your flesh goes away, it's going to rot and it's going to corrupt and there's nothing left of it for eternity. You're not taking anything with you. So as a believer, you have this choice that you have to make. Am I going to operate in the liberty that I've been given and serve God and make a difference for all of eternity? Or am I going to stand over here and throw junk in a boat with a hole in it? It doesn't matter what junk you throw into the boat with the hole in it. It's going to end up at the bottom of the sea. And quite frankly, if you operate in sin, the end result of that is what? Death, meaning it's, 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 it's here in the flesh and that flesh is going to be gone and you're not going to have anything left. Does that get the point of that? Not, I'm not saying that you're ever... Your sin was put on Christ. 
But what you do in the flesh now ends up dying with the flesh. Right? That's how the flesh works. Now let's look at a couple different examples. One things I love, one that one of the things I love about the scriptures is that uh, as I study and I look at the scriptures and I try and figure out how what what does this passage mean? And I rub my beard a little bit and it doesn't really help. But as I study and I look at the scriptures, what does God do? He gives us examples of things. So go to Romans chapter 7. You're told to stand fast in the liberty. Where are you told where where are you where are you told told that? Where are you told that? Galatians chapter Five. Good. Now, don't turn there. I told you to go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 19, says, For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would do, would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, there's a lot of talk about law there. And the tendency that I have, and maybe you have this tendency as well, is that when you talk about law, you always think Old Testament, Old Testament, Old Testament. But what is a law? What is a law? It's a rule, right? It's just, it's just a rule that dictates what you do. Romans chapter 7 shows you that you get to choose some rules, right? You can choose the rule in your members, which is what? The law of sin and death. Or you can choose the law of God through your, the renewing of your mind. Now look at 8 verse 1. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So there is a law of the Spirit, which now indwells me, right, of life in Christ. What do you think that means? It's liberty. That's right, because where the Spirit of the Lord is, it's liberty. But it's liberty from the flesh. Liberty from the law. I I taught on tithing last year, and the basis of my message on tithing was that tithing should be ran by grace principles. And I gave you a grace principle, which was Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. And why have we been given liberty according to Galatians chapter 5, 13? By, By love to serve one another. We've got liberty to serve one another. Now, what Romans chapter 8 verse 2 tells you that there's this spirit, the law of the spirit of life in Christ. So if I allow the spirit to rule my life in Christ, right? If I put his word in my brain and instead of making decisions based off of my flesh, I make decisions based off of the spirit by his word working in me, I am going to be abiding by the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Simple, right? That's what I like about the scriptures. They're simple. First Corinthians chapter six. There's a principle there. Then I got 10 minutes left. We're going to fly. First Corinthians chapter six. Paul says this. That was my introduction in how, how, how do we walk in liberty. Hopefully you've seen how liberty works and how things work. I'm going to just give you some brief things on how you walk in liberty and um, in somewhat machine gun fashion here. Where did I tell you to go? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Paul says, all things are lawful unto me. All things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So... Are all things lawful for me? All things lawful for you? Can you sin that grace may abound? What happens when you sin that grace may abound? Grace abounds, right? It's a mathematical equation. Sin, grace. Sin, grace. It's just, grace always abounds. Do you have the option to do that? Yes, because your sin has been paid for. So now you have to ask the question, what is expedient for me? And generally, we look at that and we say, oh, so what's good for me, right? 
yes and no. Yes, from the standpoint that I tell you that we look at liberty from the flesh too often, so I say, hey, what's good for me to do? Well, I like doing this, and I'm under grace, and I can go do that, right? But I want you to look at this passage as you read through here, and um, it says this. Uh, verse 13, meats for the belly, belly for the meats, but God shall for both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord, it, and, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. Do you notice what he does there when he says that your bodies are members of Christ? He takes the picture off of you because you like to put it in your flesh and look at liberty from your flesh. And he says, now you need to think about what? The body of Christ. Am I going to participate in this? Because if I do, I'm going to be dragging the body of Christ into it as well. So now, as you can see, the Spirit's given you some liberty to think apart from your flesh. Because in your flesh, you're like, should I do this? Oh, yeah. I'm coming. But in the Spirit, you say, now, wait a minute. I've got a different purpose from fulfilling the lust of the flesh and the desires of my mind and playing in the course of this world. And now I can make a decision based on the church, the body of Christ. And I don't want you guys to be joined up with my sin because we're all part of the same body. You see how the focus shifts? It's the liberty is going to allow me to serve you by love. And you do the same for me. That's real liberty, isn't it? Remember I said, I, I look at the problems in my life and I say, you know what? I know who caused those. And it's me. I have the option to get outside of those and operate according to the Spirit. Do all your problems go away? No. Does it get better? Yeah. All right. I'll give you some quick examples. If you've got a problem with sin, because everybody talks about positions and doctrines and things, we all I, I'm good at saying, hey, oh, well, you're, you're dead to sin. Don't participate in it. Okay, well, how, how do I get away from it? Tell, tell me how to do it. I mean, you've told me that I'm in bondage. You told me I need to think through the Spirit. How, how do I get out of bondage? Well, if you're in bondage with sin, there's a wonderful passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and you're probably going to say, well, how is that a passage about bondage to sin and to the flesh? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you turn there, if I say 1 Corinthians chapter 11, what pops into your head? The Lord's Supper, right? So the Corinthians get together. The Corinthians are a picture of bondage to the flesh aren't they the galatians are a picture of bondage to the law the corinthians according to second corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 paul doesn't want them to receive the grace of god in vain how do they receive the grace of god in vain if god gave you grace and liberty to go out and serve one another and you decide you don't want to serve one another anymore isn't the grace of god in vain it's not gone but isn't it like, well, what, what do you have it for? The Galatians were in bondage to the law, and he says that they have what to the grace of God? Frustrated, frustrated the grace of God. Is the grace of God gone? Is it of none of, No. It's still there, but they frustrated it because they put themselves back under the law. If you participate in sin in your life, it's likely because you need to go back and look at Romans 3, 4, and 6 and get a more... We all participate in sin, but... We have a light view of it, right? We have a very heavy view of your sin. <laughs> I have a very light view of my sin. Now, the, that's, that's kind of the Corinthians. They got in that problem with fornication in their midst, right? Two places that a little, little, little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Guess where they're at? First Corinthians and rhymes with Galatians. Galatians. Good. <laughs> So what happens is those people, they've got their liberty, but are they walking in it? No. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when you look at it, it's, a, it's, it's the Lord's Supper, and the, the Corinthians are participating wrong, right? They're doing it wrong. Guy elbows one guy, get out of the way. I'm going to eat. Shovels down all the food. He gets so full that he's sick by the end of the chapter, right? 
Another guy, get out of the way, drinks all the wine, he's drunk, and he's passed out. He's asleep by the end of the chapter. And you get there, and there's another guy there that didn't even get in line, and he's starving to death. He didn't eat at home. Now, you get to the end of that chapter, and there's all kinds of different teachings about that chapter. People will tell you, if you don't confess your sins while you're taking the Lord's Supper, he's going to kill you. Don't do it. I've had people tell me that. But when you get to the end of the chapter, if that was the case, wouldn't God say, you better confess your sins before you take the Lord's Supper or he's going to kill you? But do you know what he says at the end of the chapter? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 33. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for a another. Were the Corinthians under condemnation? The chapter says that Paul had to condemn them for what they were doing and that he had to judge them. If they would have judged themselves with the word of God and looked at what they were doing, they wouldn't be condemned with the world. But Paul has to write them a letter and say, hey, you guys are acting like infantiles infants running and cutting in line and your flesh is in the way of what's going on and you know how to stop doing that tarry one for another sounds a little too simple doesn't it but what does liberty do by love serve one another tarry one for another the book of galatians And I'm, I'm going to run through this real quick, and then I'm going to give you some verses to look at to close with. Galatians had a problem with the law. Galatians chapter 2, verse 2 tells you that they frustrate the grace of God. If you have a problem with the law, do you know what you have a problem with? Self-righteousness. Okay? Well, how does that work? Well, if you think that you can fulfill the law through your works and have merit before God because of what you do, then you are self-righteous. Is there any other way around it? No. So the Galatians had a problem. They were put under the law. They were put under self-righteousness. If you have a problem with self-righteousness, what do you need to go? Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, right? You notice where all these things are pointing you back to? So they had a problem with self-righteousness. They were put under the law. And then Paul talks to them and he says, hey, you're frustrating the grace of God. You think you're going to be made perfect by the flesh? Where do they need to be back into? Operating in the spirit. And by the time he gets through and he teaches them about you're free from the law and he gets to Galatians chapter 5 and he says, stand fast in the liberty. By verse 13, he's telling them how to serve one another. By chapter 6, he's telling them how to pull somebody out of bondage without falling in the mud yourself. He's showing them that what do they got to do to do this? Serve. So here's my point. If you've got a problem with sin, if you've got a problem with sin, you probably have a light view of sin. As a believer, you need to go back and look at sin and look how bad the bondage you were in is and look at, look at who you are in Christ and through the Spirit and putting His Word in your mind, renew your mind and go walk in the Spirit instead of loading up that boat with a hole in it. If you've got a problem with the law, you need to realize that you're not righteous. But in both cases, when you look at Corinthians and Galatians, what does he tell them to do? Love and serve one another. Tarry one for another. By love, serve one another. He tells them to look out for the members of the body of Christ. And let me tell you, that's the fastest way away from you. Right? The fastest way away from me is to serve you. And if I am my problem in the flesh, then I should spend more time serving you. Let me close with a couple verses. Just write them down. Romans chapter 8 verse 4 tells us to walk in the... Yeah. Do you know how to do that? Real simply, we're told in Ephesians just to redeem time, right? Your life is made up of time. If you write down everything that you do on a daily basis and you look at it and you say, did I do that for the spirit or do I do it for flesh? Spirit for flesh, spirit for flesh. And I realize you may not want to do this. <laughs> I don't want to do this. But I can look at my life and say, hey, when do I walk in the spirit? When do I walk in the flesh? And what I want to do is increase that time walking in the spirit because what that is doing is exercising liberty from the bondage 
that I was in. And I can redeem time, which is exactly opposite of throwing stuff on a boat with a hole in it. I can go impact eternity. You've got to get out of your own flesh, right? What does Jeremiah 17 tell us about our heart? It's deceitful. It's wicked. Proverbs chapter 16 says, if you make a decision about what you're doing, Proverbs 16, 2, what does it look like to you? That it's right in your own eyes, right? You've got to get out of this guy because everything he does looks right in his own eyes, and it's nothing but pure bondage. You've got to get over here and start making your decisions based off this. Category, categorize your life. Once you figure out what I'm doing with my life, put verses next to every part of that so that you know you're walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time that we've had in your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power in its life. I pray that we will stand fast in the liberty that we have and walk in the spirit. It's in your name. Amen.